My name is Kevin Knight. I'm an affiliated consultant with WJE. Um, a very quick part of my history. Um, as you can tell from my accent, I'm not from these parts. I was deported from the UK in the late 70s, sent to Canada and put to work in the construction industry. So um, where I live is one of the harshest places on the planet. Winnipeg, Manitoba, if you've ever heard of it. We have a temperature difference of nearly 100 degrees Fahrenheit, sorry, Celsius, between summer and winter. I still have six feet of snow in my backyard. And if you can build something and make it work in my hometown, you can build it anywhere in the world and make it work. So um, in the 80s, I started to work a lot with the Canadian government. They took me down to Boston when their energy code came in. And since then, I've spent about 50% of my time working down here. Three years ago, I joined WJE. Previous to that, I was with John's Group Architectural Testing. And currently, I work also teaching at a local college, having a great deal of fun. So that's me. Right, part two. We're going to go through the step-by-steps of the building envelope commissioning process. We're going to get to the nuts and bolts of it. We're going to get into the trenches and see what we actually have to do to make the thing work. And we're going to look at the stakeholders, the political structure of how we make this work, the human interaction between all the players. You've probably all seen this, but this is the earliest reference I can find on commissioning. Amaradi had it right all these years ago. Basically, if you put a building up and the building fell down and killed somebody, you're allowed to take the builder out and kill him. That worked for thousands of years, but unfortunately, lawyers have got involved and today we can't do this anymore. But that worked for thousands of years. A little bit of history, a little bit of background. In 1953, Dr. Neil from Canada discovered that 35% of building's energy can be due to air leakage. A lot. 35% due to air leakage. What else happened up in Canada was the fact we started getting premature building on the failure. This is only 10 years old. The amount of three-store cycling, the ice lensing has destroyed the masonry completely. This whole section of brick came down overnight in one go at 3 o'clock in the morning. It's a school. Ice lensing in the wall, corrosion of the masonry ties, and the brick down here all came down in one shot. This isn't a demolition project. This is a complete failure. 3 o'clock in the morning, thank goodness. Six hours later, the kids were being playing underneath this. A lot of damage to stucco, paint, different materials, and dramatic building envelope failure. This is a four-inch piece of limestone, three feet by four feet, attached very close to a window in a highly humidified building, highly pressurized building. And you can see this, horror, sorry, this vertical crack. Now we have two pieces of stone, two inches thick. This front piece is no longer connected to the building. Sidewalk about 60 feet down. Next bit, in 2006, the Department of Energy came up with 40% of building's energy uh, loss was due to air leakage. They could have just read Dr. Neal's work from about 50 years previously and got the same answer. So where this is all going is we had to do something the way we were building our construction industry, the dramatic failures we're having, energy loss, and come up with some solution. And so commissioning seemed like a good idea to commission the building envelope as long as, as well as the mechanical system. So our first reference, and we've been talking to this a lot, 2006, the NIBS guideline three, closely followed by its CSA document. Has anybody seen this document? I'm really surprised. John has, great. Dan has, okay. This, um, I was invited about, uh, oh, 2009, to join this committee, uh, because at the time, there was only these four disciplines, horizontal, vertical transportation, electrical, mechanical, and controls. They'd missed the building envelope completely. And when the feds came through town to town, they discussed what else should we have in commissioning. I said, well, you're missing one of the most important factors. Where's the building envelope? And so that was included. It's all embracing document, and it discusses the principles of commissioning 
the same in every single discipline. As mechanical engineers, mechanical commissioning agents, you follow the same path as we do for the architectural. The OPR, the basis of design, pre-construction, construction, and operations and maintenance. It's all the same process. What we do during those processes are very, very different. And just this is our ASTM 2813, as Dan has explained to you over the past uh, hour or so here, what this entails, the, the di disciplines within it, and the same listing of the actual procedures that we have to follow are the same as you're all very, very familiar with. What gets a little bit different, though, is how we have to approach the owners about what they actually want. Many owners I go to, and I ask them the simple questions. You know, how long do you want the building for? What are you going to use the building for? Where are you going to put the building? And quite often, they don't have good answers for me. So we just a little bit of uh, history here with it. These are the questions we should be asking. Energy, environment, safety, security. How long is going to be the occupancy? How many days of the week are you going to use it? How long do you want it for? Is it durable and sustainable? The owner has to be able to answer these questions for his building envelope. Is it going to be a seismic area? What's the snow load? What's the environment he's going to put the building down in? So, a little bit of history. These are my relatives on the southwest corner of England, on the Cornish coast, and this building was commissioned. It suits their need. They are shell fishermen. They go out and they collect mussels and whelks. So where they're building, is, it has to be close to where they work, right beside the coast. They needed to see when the tide came in and went out, and so the window was very, very important for them to see when they can go to work. And what is very, very important, like fish and friends, when you're storing your house, you want good ventilation. So they get air exchanges per second. <laughs> the roof doubles up as a clothes dryer. <laughs> Everything works. Everything meets their need. They had a well-defined OPR. How many building materials? One. Simple. Where did the building materials come from? It comes right where they're living. It's a hole in the wall. The other side of my family was far more roguish. Sorry? It was a platinum. Absolutely. Guaranteed platinum. Environmentally friendly. There was no animals killed in the process of everything you want out of a lead program. So the other side of my family was a bit more roguish. They went around raping and pillaging. When they came back home, defense was their main need. So they wanted great big thick walls three feet of stone. Anybody know why windows are long, tall, and skinny in castles? You got it, right? Designed so you can shoot out of hard to shoot into. Comfort inside the castle was very similar to what the cave is. Poorly defined, maybe a fireplace, but defense was the main reason they built. How many building materials? Probably three, four now definitely have stone. There's some wood involved. and We have a little bit of ivory thrown into the uh, equation as well. And that's really about it. Where did the materials come from? As close as you could get them. You don't want to haul stone far. Okay? Uh, but a simple building construction meets the needs. This does not like going forwards. There we go. Jump forward to today. Things have changed dramatically. A hospital in Alaska. So the owner, he needs to treat, heal, and teach in a climate that is very, very different from the inside of the building to the outside world. The delta between the outside to the inside of the building, you're probably looking at that 100 degrees Fahrenheit change between the inside to outside. Is the building pressurized? Probably in certain areas. Is it depressurized? Probably in others. So the loads are very different than what we're looking at. So how many building materials? Hard to count, isn't it? Precast, stone, glass, metal, rubber. And that's just what we can see. Underneath that, we have all our functional layers. We now have to control air. We have to control vapor. We need insulation. And drainage planes are so important. 
We need natural daylighting. And we need to be quiet. We don't want the patients hearing the noise from the outside world. So how many trades involved? How many specialists are involved? The sequence of events of adjoining the assemblies so all those functions line up is a challenge. And where do the materials come from? All over the planet. We have compatibility issues. We have sequencing issues. And one point of failure will lose the occupied space use. So that's the challenge we have today. This is why commissioning is now so important. Look, this is driving me nuts. Come on. There we go. And sometimes the basis of design just defeats itself. <laughs> so, how many years do you want the building? So important to define. Is it going to be a short-lived building? No, no, no. This doesn't like working. Or is it going to be a monument, 100 years plus? And should we consider the selection of materials and design according to how long we want it? Absolutely. Many people have expectations of this 75 to 100 years, and they compromise with their buildings because the durability factor them, you will not get that life expectancy out of it. I'm going to have to go behind here. This mouse isn't working. So, a short-lived building. Isn't that, uh, you know, how long do you want your igloo for? If it lasts a couple of days, it's fine. It works. You don't spend too much money on it. The simple materials. Yep, get the buttons working right. We come to then what we consider midlife buildings, our big box stores. How long do you think that the uh, big box store owners really wanted or considered the use of this building to begin with? 15 to 25 years, maybe? They've got a lot of them now that are into the 40, 50 year range that are in desperate need of maintenance because they've exceeded the life service of the building materials that were selected. Our residential homes. How long should a home last for? Where I come from, we never think about the end life of a home. It goes from generation to generation, from family to family. Most people think about, oh, as long as it lasts me 10 years, I'll be happy because I'm moving. The nature of our transient population now is that how long do we consider a life cycle for a normal home, our materials? Look at the outside of most homes now and consider that thin eggshell. How long is that going to be serviceable for? Or is it a monument? Is it a building that's a research centre that is never going to go away? So you have to select your materials, your design accordingly. And where you put it down on the planet, so important. Uh, lots of the times, uh, you know, I work all in these climates all over the area, but you have to then say, where I put this building, the occupied space, to the climate I'm going to put it down to, creates the forces and loads that my envelope is going to have to take. And you've all seen this map probably loads and loads of times. Let's see if I can get my mouse track. Oh, it's actually working now. Wonderful. Here we are. Um, I work a lot in the northeast, and I've seen designs that were drawn down here, built back up here, and surprise, surprise, they fail. No, no surprise on that. I am going to kill my mouse. I don't know what Laverne did to it. So, are we in the desert? Or are we coastal? Coastal when it's quiet and, and coastal when it's stormy. Very different environments, but we have to design them and select materials accordingly. This is uh, on the side of the Arctic. This is on the edge of Hudson Bay. It's a town centre, one of the most severe climates I've ever worked in. And this building actually lasted for about 25 years before it had serious concerns with not supporting the designed life use. John was up there playing with the polar bears a little while ago as well. And that's the normal snow load every year. But our weather's changing. Where I live, I, I've seen events with rain that have never been recorded before in the last hundred years. We're seeing dramatic weather changes. Katrina, the 100-year event is happening every two years. We're having floods all over the place. 
Now, when we are looking at how we actually design our buildings, we look backwards, not forwards. I was actually, sorry, I was actually hoping this video was going to play. There we go. This is Haldo, the big dust storm in Phoenix, about three years ago. I was on the last plane coming in, and you'll see that little plane, I'm on that one. And the following day, the amount of sand and dust that was inside the buildings, everybody was suffering for weeks after that event. So, where are we going with this? I don't think we should look backwards when we're designing buildings and saying what's happened in the past. We've got to go looking forward from this point on and saying what have we done to the planet? Let's think about how our climate change is affecting us and design accordingly. Our building codes have to change to reflect that. Somebody just asked if it was lead, platinum, gold or silver. Um, what I'm talking about, one point, maybe two points in this whole program is about making sure that your building envelope is going to last and work. But we have to change that ranking. We have to change what they're doing within LEED. So, basis of design. Uh, this is when we've actually finally got the owner to say, this is what I want, how long I want it for, and we're going to use it. Now it goes to the architect to come up with some other ideas. Now, every time I go to an architect, I ask him, what is going to be the humidity inside the building? What's going to be the pressure? How many times do you think I get an answer where they know how the building is going to be operated? Very, very rarely. Extremely rarely do they come up and say, oh, it's going to be 35% RH, it's positively pressurized. So my question is, how can you design a building envelope when you're not, you haven't got an understanding of what you're trying to contain with inside the envelope? So they have to work on what the building is going to be run. Are the layers accessible? if they need maintaining? Are the layers durable? Or do we have non-maintainable layers put in non-accessible areas that is a design concern? Er, and how is it sold? Is it design built? Is somebody making a decision on the detailing that shouldn't be? Is it at risk? So, when I'm doing my design review, I go back to this wonderful document. It's a free download from the Canadian government. It was first written out in the 50s, and it was republished in 1997 as a much shorter version. The first uh, one was three volumes, about three inches thick each one. But what it basically tells us to do, uh, to explain, it asks the same question. How long do you want the building for? and defines it very well between these four sections. And what came out of that one was another CSA standard, which please buy this document. It is very valuable. What they talk to are the mechanisms of deterioration. What actually makes your building fail? And they go through for the moisture, air contaminants, uh, ground contaminants, biological agents, temperature, solar radiation, differential movement. And then you can look at all the materials you put into your actual building and decide whether they're going to last for the life of the building. This is one of these unreadable slides. So uh, from the back there, you look at the building assemblies on the left-hand side. So we have windows, glazing, corking sealants. We have air vapor barriers then the material types and how long they will actually, uh, what they're made of. You set the actual life cycle of the building. This one is for 60 years. And then you look at each one of these types of materials and it will tell you what the life expectancy is of each single material. So the first one there is curtain wall for 30 years, but it's a 60-year life cycle building. So what does that tell us straight away? that maybe we're going to have to change the glass at least once during the life of the building. So, category, significance in use. Frequency every 30 years. How do you get to the swing stage? So it's expensive to replace, hard to get to. So you come down to the, uh, say, the sealants, glazing beads. Design life for a glazing bead, 10 years. 
So how many times does this have to be recorked? And if you don't do that through the life of the building, you're going to have secondary damage with water infiltration to the building. A great document, and it goes through this step-by-step -step way of doing an analysis of your materials. That being said, I'm not going to say a lot on this photo. This is in my hometown. This is what they call cloud walls. It's all made of glass, structurally glazed. What separates the inside world from the outside world is a corking bead. Now, when it came to this building to be handed over, usually you have to wash the windows. Yep, usual thing. So the window cleaners that gave a price for this came from Quebec. They came into the building, looked on the inside of the building, this is just from the inside, and said, we can't do this, we're going home. So they had to engage special rescue people, mountaineers, climbers, and the local fire brigade to train people who were in the window cleaning business how to climb on the inside of these walls and clean it. The price tag for a one-time clean was just under half a million dollars for cleaning the glass. Unexpected. They looked at the outside and said, oh, we don't know how we could even get there. Accessibility is a huge issue. So, that being said, think through glass. This is a monument, never going to go away. Glass every 30 years, corking beads every 10, and it's non-accessible. Can't tell you, they'd have to kill me. Right. Look it up on the, you'll see it on the internet. Yeah. But it's a museum. It's a very new one. But it's, this does not stand alone. We look at today's modern architecture, you look at any of these weird shapes, and they're hard to build. Right? And very hard to maintain. So the CSA guide would have told us that, yeah, we've got a, a lot of money to spend every 10 years fixing that. Durability under load. Who would think about putting glass where we have a snow line like this every year? Right. Replaced by plywood. This is actually in this uh, Tom, uh, Churchill uh, town centre, right on the Hudson Bay. Are there any other considerations what you would want to separate from the inside world to the outside world with glass when you're in the Arctic? Loaded question. You don't want him in your living room. And there's him going home. Uh, my partner was working up there one day and he said, yeah, sh job shut down again. Why? Bear is in the school. It'll be two hours before they can trank him, bring him out, then we can start work again. It comes with the territory. But these are mechanisms of deterioration. These are biological agents. Spores, mold, is a extreme small. This is extremely large. And everything in between we have to be concerned about. So, do not design a roof that is a bat cave. <laughs> Why would you want to do that? If you know bats live here, live in this lovely dark black area, dark area, lovely moist. So, design phase. Uh, we have to back off the architects a little bit. We've been beating up on them so much. I always think of it aesthetics over function. The more complicated the building looks, the harder it's going to be to get it to work. Mr. Aisha, wonderful, wonderful graphic designer. And this is some of the best moisture water control I've ever seen drawn. You can draw it, can you build it? And we're faced with this on a continual day-to-day -day basis with our design review. The more complicated it is, the harder it will to function. And the materials that you place on this, this dark material here, this is our peel and stick air vapor barrier waterproofing. It's three feet wide, 40 mils thick, and it's made of uh, high-density polyethylene with asphalt. And it has a wonderful memory to it. So if you stretch a flat sheet onto a cone, what's going to happen? You're inducing stress. 
and he wants to go back to its original form. So selection of the right material for the right shape and its exposure and use must be considered. Then we look at all our properties of our materials. Vapour barriers, air barriers, drainage planes, thermal protection. And what materials do we select that provides those properties? To get them then to work to the structure of the building, then meet the aesthetics, it's a challenge. And when uh, I first put this slide together, we said, that's a mess, that looks horrible. But that's reality. And all our materials, we have to say what properties they have and where do we place them within the envelope. And the wrong property in the wrong place, you have failure. Simple alignment. Do you believe that a wall or window should align? Makes great sense to me that all the vapour barriers, air barriers, thermal planes, drainage, should line up. And when they don't, things don't work. And when we do our diagnostic work on buildings, when we look at failure, if the misalignment of these functions are there, that's where we have our points of failure. No surprise. So design review. When we look at the design here, where's the dew point? How do we fasten this through? How do we seal the air barrier? Come on. Sequence of construction. I'm going to have to speed up here a little bit. I don't want to run out of time. This one is absolutely a wonderful example. It's a glass reinforced uh, concrete panel. There's a metal liner on the inside. We have our... Let's see if we get that pencil going here again. No, I don't know. Yes, this is our drywall. Yeah. Right. So the problem is this whole thing is put together. I'm going to throw this thing through here. With tape on the back of the metal. That's our functional seal between the outside world and inside world. So how do we get it there? If the drywall is up already, we can't get to it. And if we put this material up before the drywall, we can't install the last sheet of uh, the drywall. It's a complete impossible no-build. But you can draw it. Why would you want to make everything so complicated? But the functional layers are following the outside profile of the building. There's no continuity, there's disconnections between it all, and it won't function. Instead of keeping the box very simple, wrapping it, then put all the aesthetics pinned to the outside. And my favourite of all time, this is a, a plan section through. It's a precast column cap with a curtain wall. And what happens when the glass gets broken? You have to take the precast down to change the glass. So this is what we do for a living when we're commissioning design review going through all these things, material compatibility, is it buildable, what's the sequence, and what's the maintenance. Pre-construction, uh, we do some computer modelling, we try and make sure we've got the right trades in place, that can be very difficult. Uh, co coordinate the uh, pre-bid meeting so everybody understands the degree of difficulty, look at the materials and selection, and uh, get the team together. Who are the specialists? Dan spoke earlier about you know, what is a specialist, what's the definition of it. What I'm saying here is you may need a specialist in your team that's handling lighting and acoustics. I know nothing how to deal with lighting and acoustics. It's a very specialised trade. And you may have to make sure you get them on your team, as well as some of the actual trade specialists. And what you do at this point, you design the testing programme. From the ASTM standard, this slide you can't read, you pick all the tests that you need to put this building together, and you design that and make sure that everybody knows what the procedure is going to be. The specialist list, this is what we showed earlier. This is Judd Peterson's work, Patterson's work, um, Peterson, Peterson, uh, from uh, NIBS, BTEC. And what he shows here are all the different trades that will be working with it, the glazers, the masons, then the degree of knowledge they'll need to become a specialist in their trade. You talk to a mason who's been in the field for 30 odd years, you want him telling you if it's right or wrong. You don't want someone who's been doing it for five years. So you have to pick those specialists. Uh, Wolfie, a wonderful program. It will tell you, ah, go away, this computer's killing me. It's a hydrothermal program that will tell you if your wall's at risk. You select the materials from the outside world to the inside wall. You put the humidity and temperature of the building. You put it down what location it's going to be. 
and you press the run button, and it will give you best case, worst case scenario over the last 10 years, and it will identify if you have any wetting potentials in materials that won't be durable when they get wet. It's limited in its use. It's purely, basically, two-dimensional, but it will tell you if you have any inherent design problems. The one I really like is Therm. This tells you what the temperature is, the surface temperature of the materials that you have, a window against a stud wall, and these colours here, you'll basically see that we're actually below freezing point where the green is. That is at about minus three on the scale. So that was the result of the placement of that window. Dew point was at four degrees Celsius. Of course, when you're at minus three, you've got the condensation, then you've got ice. By simple design adjustment, by moving the window to the warmer side of construction, the ice goes away, snow goes away. It's that simple about the association between certain thermal barriers within one wall assembly to the next. Pre-construction uh, startup meetings, very important. Get everybody in the room, have all the arguments in that meeting and try and minimise the ones you have actually on site. So review construction. Who owns the joints and junctions? Nobody owns the joints and junctions when you put your shop drawings in. That wonderful letter there say, by others. The difficult stuff never wants to be purchased out. Who's got the uh, review of the submittal shop drawings and talk about the mock-up? Shop drawings, sometimes you have a wonderful drawing. It looks very, very simple. The shop drawing comes in very, very different than what was anticipated. And when you look at the degree of com complexity of putting this detail together, when I asked the trades, can you actually build this? Their answer was, of course not, it's impossible, but it's a great opportunity for some extras. Looking at site conditions never reflected what the drawings were in the first place, deflection joints, nothing was straight. So mini mock-ups were built. But when everything said and done, when the gravity anchors came in to hold the stone, it ripped all the flashings up. So it's not until the last nut and bolt goes into the wall can we say that we've proven the actual detail. Climate. Life can be good one day. The next day, you can have a surprise. You have to keep the materials within their limitations, what they can be used, and protect them. Wet walls, who would be stupid enough to install materials over those walls? The answer is it happens all the time. Ownership of the actual work, sequencing of events is so important. Years ago, the finishing trades owned everything underneath their brick, underneath their metal, underneath their steel. There's a tendency now to actually remove that responsibility away from the finishing trades and have specialist trades that are doing the air vapour barrier materials. But now we have to change the sequence of events because we have to test and inspect this before we cover it up. It's like that multi-layer. If you can't see it, it's buried. It's very hard to prove it's been done right. So the whole sequence has to be carefully planned so QC, QA can be done on the exposed materials before it's covered up by the brick and insulation. Right, down to the last couple of slides here. Um, I put this together is the stakeholders and the relationship between all the parties involved. So we have the owner at the top of the pyramid and in the right world the designer and the commissioning agent are engaged roughly at the same time. Now, people from the, the mechanical world here, uh, what, what's typical for your engagement when a project's coming in? Can I just fire it? Is it like this? Is it immediate or is it later? Because this is so important with the relationship between everybody. Who's the master-servant relationship and where does it go? So I believe this is the correct structure for it and we can discuss at length if you see different. Then the contractor comes in. The contractor, of course, has his trades. The trades have suppliers of the manufactured goods. A testing agency, which John will be going through in the next few minutes here with all the different test procedures that will happen onto it. So, direct engagement to the owner with the building commissioning agent is the ideal world. Sometimes we see it positioned differently, sometimes even put underneath the general contractor's 
uh, control. So if that's the case, and I've got bad news, I'm taking it to the guy, I'm going to upset, what's he going to do with it? You're losing control. You have to be able to get back to the owner and let him know what's going wrong. The relationship between the commissioning agent and the designer, we've just been going through the design review. We, we must keep that congenial. We do not design. We just say, can you consider this? How's this going to work? We point out sequencing events and work with the architect to do, help out in those details. And of course, direct contact with the general contractor is absolutely essential for the commissioning agent. And contract to his trades, trades to suppliers and manufacturers. But obviously there has to be a close relationship now between the contractor and the architect, the traditional relationship. And how do designers find out about materials? You've got salesmen coming into your office every day wanting to do lunch and learns for you, telling you about the best new material, the best thing since sliced bread, and how it's going to make your building work, and it's going to be a lot cheaper and quicker than all the other materials on the planet. So, after that, where did that line come in? The owner can engage the testing agency directly himself. Quite often, the general contractor has it in his uh, contingency uh, to engage a testing agency. Sometimes the trades themselves have to engage a testing agency uh, for mock-ups. If it's a curtain wall uh, contractor, he may have to take his work into a lab and test it. John will show you some of those examples there. And that testing agency may have tested the standalone materials in the lab as well. Life is getting complicated all of a sudden, isn't it? How do we get all this together without any conflict of interest? It's really tough. And sometimes the building commissioning agent, provider, may have the testing agency working for him as well. This being said and done, we have to get this all put together in a politically happy family and make the building come together and deal with all the other issues that are going to be thrown at us and get the building put together. So, how do we get this here and keep a happy family? This is the hardest part of what I find the commissioning process, is being that political person who can get the end product right by communicating and negotiating, not just with the findings, but making sure those findings and deficiencies are fixed, not just become a part of the record. A wise old man told me once that, uh, you know, Kev, we can't fix everything, but by commissioning, we have a very, very good record of what's been done wrong. We can't get it right all the time. But when it, when it goes to court, not if it goes to court, we have a record of what you said was wrong, or what the testing agent said was wrong. So, my final slide. My concept of commissioning is the art of this controlled conflict. Now, I had a finishing slide on here, but John's got that at the end of his one there. So. Um, as John's changing over, any quick questions at all for this? Yes. Absolutely. Uh, just see me afterwards and I'll make sure you get those. Um, the CSA guideline, um, you can buy online. It's well worth every, every dollar. The other one is a free download. You just tap that in for uh, uh, Building Material Durability Guide for uh, the Federal Government Canada, Public Works Canada. And uh, that's a great freebie. All right, thanks, Kevin. Rand, okay, thank thanks, you so much. Thanks for keeping it to 30 minutes, too. All right, who's giving me the sides at the back? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> never, never follow this guy. But um, anyways, I had, a, I had a lot of slides for 30 minutes. I have a tremendous amount of slides for 20 minutes, but we'll try to get everyone to lunch in time. Um, what we're talking about, construction phase, pre-construction phase, we're picking up where Kevin left off in the process. I, and we're going to start off with a case study here. And I think it's important to recognize how our projects today are changing from the past. They're more complex, more expectations from the owners. Everybody wants high performance now. We have more trades. You can make an argument we have less qualified trades. We have more compartmentalization, as Dan said, of the design team. So we have multiple parties, more disconnects. 
And, it's, uh, and there's a huge emphasis on schedule. So we're seeing more unitization, more pre-built, that sort of thing. So a couple of things. I'm going to run through a project. And this is becoming the norm now. This project was located in New Jersey. They had a visual mock-up on site, not, not a tested mock-up in New Jersey. We went to China to watch the glass being fabricated. We did testing and inspections at the glass plant. Documented the QC procedures. So this, the typical commissioning activities that we would do on site in terms of inspections and testings, you have to do where the building's being built. So if the building's not being built on site, you gotta go to the fabrication plant, wherever it may be, and you have to do those commissioning activities. So it's the same thing in terms of reporting and deficiency logs. Next, these, the glass went to Germany, and it was fabricated into a curtain wall frame in Germany. And so there was more testing that was done. There was a mock-up that was constructed and full-size testing, assembly testing. So again, thinking back to Dan's presentation, anyone remember their statistic on what percentage of the deficiencies happen at the interfacing? 90%. So where do we want to do our testing? on the 90%, right? We want to catch those interfaces. And so here was some of the testing that was done in Germany. And now we come back to the project site. The project site is in uh, New Jersey, and we're now doing similar tests on site. So we've come full circle, kind of around the world in some perspectives, for one project. And again, this is, this is becoming more and more the norm. So in the pre-construction phase, um, some of the things that Kevin highlighted before the kickoff meeting and the, and the shop drawings we're not going to spend too much time on. I want to highlight a little bit more on the testing and the mock-up side of things. Um, so the testing considerations. So if 90% of our problems come from interfacing, and we really, you know, that's where our exposure is, that's what, that's what the building is being judged on, does it make sense to put our testing into Division 8 or Division 7 or Division 4 where we're speaking to a material? Or does it make sense to put it up in Division I, where we're speaking to a building? Well, I, I submit, and I think a lot of folks are, are now putting this test specification up in Division I. We're talking to that general contractor. We're talking to the group of trades that this needs to work. So who writes it? Typically, the, the building envelope commissioning provider will write it and submit it to the architect for their review, revision, and approval. Um, you want to put all the mock-up and the field criteria in there. Um, and I think there's some things that we need to be cautious of, and Dan alluded to this before. Not only are there different pass-fail criteria, but a lot of these standards that we're referencing have no pass-fail criteria. So you can't just put a test in that doesn't have pass-fail criteria. Believe me, that's not a fun day when you go execute the test and then everyone says, now what? And so um, if you, as we go through some of these tests, if you're not familiar with it, if you're faced with writing a uh, functional performance test plan yourself, I encourage you to read the standards, to understand what the cr criteria is, and if there's no pass-fail criteria, to add one into your specification. Uh, otherwise, again, the testing might not be too fruitful. There's other things you have to think about, too. Certain sites have geometric constraints or other constraints where it's very difficult to access the site. So in this particular case, there was no road, so we had to put test equipment on a train. They had one forklift in town, so if the lumber yard needed the forklift, you're not going to test. So you have to build that in to your schedule and your cost when you anticipate um, what you can do. Uh, some, the climate, I'm not going to, I think Kevin hit the climate pretty good, so we'll just, we'll highlight one thing here. The testing should simulate Mother Nature as best you can. If wind-driven rain is a big concern, your testing should simulate as best you can wind-driven rain. If you have high winds, it should simulate high winds. If you have acoustical concerns, you should know what the acoustics are on site. So do your sound pressure readings on site before you start to design the building. If you know where you want to end up and you know where you start, now you can design the wall. Back to Kevin's point, if you don't know the relative humidity, how can you design a wall? If you don't know the outside sound pressures, how can you design a wall? And so it's getting that understanding up front. Just real quick on the lab testing, you know, I think what we're doing now as an industry is we're trying to get a little more conscientious about testing for durability. It's always been a tough thing to do because you're trying to speed up time in a test. And so this is an example of a test on insulated glass units. It's a four-month-long process, but it's meant to simulate a much longer 
durability. You're checking the seal between two panes of glass. Uh, here's a test, and, and these are the, both of these next two tests are in the, the new 2012 ICC code, IEEC code 2 as well. And um, these tests, you know, this is a material test. So not a whole lot of failures, not setting the bar real high. This test has an equivalent um, in terms of passing the requirements in the code as this test which is an assembly test, still a laboratory test, but this is, has the same equivalency as a whole building air test. So pass one of the three and you're good to go. I can submit to you that there's a lot of materials that have passed that first test, material test, and installed in buildings that have no chance of passing a whole building air test. And so these, these aren't, they're not the same type of test. I think you have to understand too, um, beyond just comparing a product cut sheet that you get from a manufacturer with a requirement and a specification, what that test is and how it relates to the field. So in this case, if we're doing a thermal test and we have zero degrees on one side and 70 on another and we get a condensation resistance factor, would it concern you at all to know that this has nothing to do with air infiltration, such that if it's an operable window, they're going to seal it up and they're going to seal up the weep holes and that the surrounding uh, of this fenestration is 11 inches of foam instead of a brick wall or a flashing. So how much comfort do you have that when you go to the field, you're going to see the same performance? And as a designer, how do you accommodate for that? As a commissioning agent, how do you prepare to make sure that that building is performing? Some other tests that are becoming more and more important in today's world, um, this, is, this is a new requirement for air barriers in the 2012 code. Uh, this is uh, AS, I'm sorry, NFPA 285, and so it's a two-story burn test, and uh, air barriers need to comply with this test currently. Um, and the industry has reacted, and I think there's a lot of uh, manufacturers that have this option in terms of passing this test. But if it changes the way that you're even doing the design review. If you're, if you're doing a design review to the 2009 code versus the 2012, there's different criteria that you have to take into account. Are the interior spaces the same? We're finding more and more that we are starting, as envelope folks, we're starting to come to the inside of the building now. So a disease control center, where they want to keep germs in. This is a mock-up of, of one of those facilities, where the air test criteria, you have to hold pressure for 20 minutes, a certain amount of pressure. Very hard. Think of it like a balloon with a slow leak. That's how tight this has to be. So you're getting into where you need to seal around insulation with wires because you can't afford to have that leakage area. And so we could do isolation testing to, to determine where those leak spots are with smoke and bubbles and other things um, to help get them to a successful result. You have to understand what the trades are. This is a job in the Middle, Middle East that I was on, and uh, everyone that builds this job comes off this bus. And two months ago, they came off a plane. And when they came off a plane, there's tools in the toolbox, and they pick a tool, and that's what trade they are. No joke. So you have to understand what kind of trade expectations you're going to have to help define some of this testing criteria. So just real quickly on the shop drawings, because Kevin touched upon it, and I know we're getting close in time. You, you should look for coordinated shop drawings. So at least the shop drawings should show the trade that you're looking at and any trade that you immediately touch. So if it's an air barrier, it should show sealants, fenestrations, louvers, roof interfaces, foundation interfaces, accurately, not just by others with a black box. And uh, it's not too much to ask, and we're seeing that. And yes, we do get air barrier shop drawings regularly. You want to look for compatibility, ownership, constructability, in addition to the manufacturer's requirements and certainly the construction documents requirements, conformance with the OPR and BOD. So here's just an example of a, of a coordination drawing that, that is showing the functional performance layers, you know, well beyond an architectural drawing. And this is something that the trades can really use to work off of. The mock-up, whether it's a lab mock-up in some projects, and I think you have to balance budgets and, and what you're trying to achieve in terms of selecting whether you're doing a lab mock-up or a field mock-up. I will say that a mock-up is required per 2813. So it, it could be an in situ mock-up, it could be a freestanding on-site mock-up, or it could be a laboratory mock-up. But it is a requirement, it's not optional, and it should be tested. So we can test things before and after claddings are on, and uh, we'll get into some more specific testing here. But you can do a dynamic water test, 
You could do a thermal test. Thermal test, um, there's two types of tests that are commonly done right now. It's, it's a thermal cycling. So you're simulating hot and cold temperatures, winter and summer, and you're, you're taking it through two or three years. So it's meant to be a, a version of a durability test. Um, and the other thing is you're looking at a, a perhaps a condensation resistance, so, or dew point analysis more appropriately. What's the risk of condensation? And you're using thermocouples to monitor temperatures real time when you have that interior temperature and exterior temperature differential to simulate winter and summer. More often, we're seeing a lot of freestanding on-site mock-ups now. And these mock-ups can be constructed in a way where you can get quite a bit of value out of them. You can get quantitative air testing. You can do smoke testing, which is more qualitative, and bubbles. Um, they don't have to be expensive. You know, this is a little, a little Tyvek hut. You can see the size of the car compared to the size of the mock-up there. And so this had a, a very modest budget, but we were able to do the learning that needed to be done. So in this particular project, mock-up failed horribly, and the building did just fine because we did our learning early. We did it in the mock-up. You could do mini mock-ups, too. So maybe after we're done with large-scale testing, we can do fit and finish of insulation. We could try to understand, perhaps, how these masonry ties are sealing. And so we can evaluate each individual tie, or maybe pick 10 or 15 ties in the beginning to see, with this uh, bubble solution, how are we doing? Do we have a problem holistically that needs to be addressed on this mock-up before we build the site? Another thing, if you build the mock-up correctly, that you can do is you can really get in and understand how the performance is. And it's pretty easy to identify failure points when you don't have interior finishes on. So we don't have an interior sheetrock person or an insulator that's right up behind us here. And so when you look at this type of leak, which may look like it's a fenestration leak, it was actually pretty easy to understand that it was coming from the perimeter sealant joint. And again, that's because it's all open. You can move around in the mock-up during the test, and you can be there to evaluate it. And so as we bring the lab to the field, we also have to bring the field back to the lab sometimes. And so uh, there is a couple projects that we've had where we've had air barriers that needed to be vapor permeable to be effective. So remember Kev's slide, he had the dew point in the middle of the insulation layer, and it was concerned because it wasn't an area that was controlled, controlling moisture. Well, in that particular case, you want to have a breathable air barrier on the outside so that you can have vapor pass through that. Well, a lot of the tests, this is an ASTM E96 test, it doesn't account for primers. It doesn't account for sheetrock. It doesn't account for these, the assembly of the materials. But you can sure as heck take a chunk out of the field, take it back to the lab and run an E96 on it to see, are you getting that functionality that you really need for the system to work? OK, construction phase, home stretch, seven, eight minutes. So uh, you know, building envelope commissioning is not an office job. You got to get out in the field. That's where the learning occurs. That's where the value is done. And that's, that's where you can really verify the performance. You know? So surface prep, is a wall like this ready to go? Certainly not. You know, they're not ready to spray it. It needs to be cleaned up and detailed. And there's a whole bunch of work that need to be done, even though the contractor said they were ready to go. In this particular case, they had sealants on anchor fasteners. Everything looked good until they installed the window. In this style of window, you slide the window into the sill to install it, and it sheared off all the sealant, and they had holistic sill failures because of that. And so that was something that needed to be worked on with the manufacturer and the trade to resolve. We're seeing a lot of on-site chemistry now. We got part A and part B coming together in environment X. So maybe it was a hot summer day and then it got a lot cooler or a lot damper the following day. So we have reversions of materials. We have materials that are cracking and crazing. We have incompatibilities. Even though these materials are from the same manufacturer, you know, there was, there was a chemical problem here, right? We're getting reversions, we're getting discolorization, we're getting bubbles, blisters, and holes. And so we have to be aware of these things. Um, this is a project that we worked on that um, we had a water bed on the side of our building. This is an air barrier material with a whole bunch of water between the block and the air barrier. And what happened was this wall system worked just fine, but it didn't work fine during construction before the insulation was on. We had a dew point problem. They needed temporary heating, they used propane, they had a whole lot of moisture on the inside of the building, and it ended up behind our air barrier. And so that it was a construction sequence problem. It wasn't a problem with the wall, it was a problem with the temporary conditions as the wall was being built. 
And so they ended up tearing a good chunk of that wall down. And we have all these beautiful VOC compliant products that uh, when they get exposed to moisture, such as a primer or adhesive, they don't work. So it peels off the wall. This is actually one of our buildings um, that, that houses our office over in China. It's less than 10 years old, and you can see that there's, a, there's corrosion at the bottom of that column. Less than 10 years old. Significant. And so you have to understand the environment that, that you're seeing. Certainly, as a commission agent, you want to anticipate maybe the acidity of the rain and um, build that into the process. So you don't want to see this when you come onto site and you see a weeped masonry wall and see a little bit of blue and a little bit of green there going up the jam. Well, the blue's fine. That's the air barrier. The green's not fine. That's the sheathing. And so there's a clear disconnect in the air barrier. This was a job up in New England we were on. And they were installing our unitized panels with a 10-pound sledge there. So you see the guy's about ready to whack it again. So maybe something's not working quite right in that particular case. So we're doing field testing in addition to um, construction observations. Again, when we're close to Mother Nature, we do a lot more dynamic water testing than we used to. And I think that's pretty much industry-wide now. Um, it, it, it's best simulating, simulating uh, in, at least in the northeast, a uh, nor'easter, and, uh, and in here would be a thunderstorm. You have to define your planes of air tightness. So in this particular case, this was um, essentially a duct. There's a louver that's going to go in this opening, and the air barrier seals to the louver. But interior of the louver, this is, this is the duct that takes it to two air handlers. And so essentially... The plane of air tightness, when you look up at that vented soffit, we're hemorrhaging air up and over because the boundary, the plane of air tightness, was not defined. What separates inside from outside was not defined. That's a problem. It's a disconnect between the mechanical and the uh, envelope uh, commission agents, too. So here we're building an airtight box on the outside where we come in, and the first thing we're going to do, this is a quantitative air test on an air barrier with a fenestration. So we're going to bag off the window separate. We're going to smoke the chamber to prove that it's airtight and also document where, where leaks are coming through. We're going to get a quantitative result for the air barrier and the window separate so we can actually compare those to the values that we put in our functional performance test plan. This guy in the, in the corner, he's in the room. See if you can find him. So you talk about on-site learning. You know, in this case, you're, you're learning it firsthand when you're on-site and doing it. Um, Uplift testing, and so in a lot of cases now we're working in high wind regions, or even more so, we're relying on on-site chemistry to make sure our roofs stick down. And so we're not, it's not a screw anymore, it's an adhesion. It's a chemical adhesion that's the only thing that's holding the roof down, so we're doing more uplift testing than we have in the past. This was an interesting one because the adhesive pattern that the manufacturer recommended was smaller than the flutes in the deck allowed, so something had to give, right? You got to get the parties together. So commissioning is a documentation-heavy process. You, know, you should track each individual item to resolution. A lot of times we're working now with, with programs or dashboards to kind of give you instantaneous feedback on how you're doing. So if the owner wants to log on and say, okay, how many tests did we pass, how many failed, how many retests, that sort of thing, how many comments have been resolved. In the O&M phase, we're doing whole blade air testing, infrared scanning, warranty packages, some training compiling the BCX record. This was kind of cool. I, the first time I saw this, where somebody put the warranty right on the building. So this is a, a metal sign that talks about you can't touch it without talking, I think, Firestone in this case, which is kind of interesting. Whole building air testing. Um, you know, regularly we're getting well-commissioned buildings to be four times tighter than, it, than code. So as mechanical designers, should we be designing to what we think we should achieve? Absolutely. Do we need to have that discussion in the programming phase when we're um, doing the energy modeling, when we're designing system capacity? Absolutely. And so we need to work together. We need to not be in separate camps as we have in the past. A lot of times when you do the whole brain air test, you're also doing thermography at the same time. So I'm going to stop there, and I think I'm on time. I did have a case study that we could do maybe later, but uh, I appreciate it. It's good to be back here. You're a very attentive audience. And does anyone have any questions? No questions. Piece of cake. I guess. Yeah. Well, thank you.